This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 381. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. Hey, what's going on, everyone? It's Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast, here with my co-host, the man, David Green. What's up, buddy? It's a great day. The sun is out. I ran like five miles yesterday, which I haven't wow. done in a long time. I had to split was it somebody, up over two somebody different runs. Chasing you? Someone chased that. Um, <laughs> very, very nice. <laughs> Oh. And right before we recorded this show, we helped put a house hack client under contract um, right at asking price. So you have to go over. So it's a good day, like Ice Cube would say. Wow, very nice. I, I, Ice Cube reference. Wow, you are, you are having a good day. Well, let's make everyone else's day good because today's show is going to make your day even better because here's the deal. Today we're sitting down with one of the like one of the smartest investors I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. His name's Tucker Merrihew. He was on our show a long time ago. Let me see if I can find the number. Episode 22. Wow, you're good. Episode 22. So like almost seven years ago, I think about seven years ago, uh, he was on our show. And uh, you'll hear a little bit more about him and his story, but he's been through the last recession. They invested on their way down last time and then the way back up again. And so today he shares with us five rules for investing in a down market. Now specifically, he's done, he, I mean, he's done uh, new construction. He's done flipping. He's done wholesaling. I think he's even done a bunch of rentals. He's done, he's done all sorts of stuff. And they've got a machine down in the Portland, Oregon area. Uh, but he talks about what those five rules are and how you can get through the coming economic difficulties if, uh, you know, no matter how bad it gets, based on these rules. They're very, very smart. Uh, he's got a lot of good stuff to say today. So with before that, did that make any sense? With before that, that <laughs> makes sense. With that, before we get to the interview, let's hear today's quick, quick tip. tip. Hi, David Green. What is our quick tip for today? Today's quick tip is don't assume that because everybody else is not doing something that you shouldn't not be doing something. That Really, what you're looking for is barriers to entries in times when other people are not taking Ooh. action. That's a huge, huge thing. So right now, there's a lot of people say, you know, I really don't know about real estate. I just want to wait and see. That's when you need to sprint. That's when you have yeah. to go harder. You can catch opportunities that you normally wouldn't get. So fight the herd mentality. Don't think because everyone else is doing it, you should do it too. You're really looking for the opposite mentality to be successful. That's a good quick tip for today. Very nice, man. Way to do it last minute because I didn't tell you that was coming. <laughs> oh, but I knew it was coming because I knew you didn't have anything. So I'm finally <laughs> catching up to you, B. And I think we are ready to jump into the show with Tucker. Anything you want to add before we get into it, DG? Uh, no, this is just such a good episode. And it's not just typical, oh, in a recession, you should pay less. That type of advice is not yeah, what you're yeah. going to get here. This is good, practical, sensible stuff. Yeah, it's awesome, man. All right. Well, with that, let's get to today's show with Tucker Merrihew. All right, Tucker, welcome back to the Bigger Pockets podcast, man. How you been doing? Well, it's been what, seven years almost? So it's been a little uh, while. Over the, over the past seven years, I've been doing awesome. I I appreciate you guys having me back. We're taking a little uh, stroll down memory lane, although circumstances are a little bit different right now. They are a little bit different. I mean, one uh, Josh Dorkin has changed his look quite a bit, and now he's got a shaved head, and he looks like a, a NFL. I don't know. I was gonna say lineman crossed with a cop. So. This is David Green. I'm sure you guys have now met, but uh, yeah, man. I'm oh, I see what show. you were going for there. <laughs> that that? I am Josh Sorkin. Okay. Exactly. Look at that, man. Apparently my jokes fell, fall flat today. I'll blame it on the uh, getting up at 4 a.m. and 3 a.m. and 2 a.m. With, uh, with Wilder. Awesome. Anyway. What's up, guys? So let's talk about real estate. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to go to market. Like, well, no, I was going to go to market. What's your market like? But some people don't even know who you are. I mean, back when you were on a show, we had like seven people listening and three of them were like my family. So today <laughs> we got like a lot more. So who are you, Tucker? What do you do? What's your what's your story in a nutshell? I got to say you had more than seven listeners back then because you guys were a big springboard to me starting my own show even back then. So you, you guys definitely had a listener base. But for those okay. people that don't know me, um, you know, I've been in the real estate game since about 2002 in a variety of different ways, but I started in the mortgage game. And, um, you know, I was one of those greasy, grimy loan officers way back when that slang a bunch of, uh, you know, less than uh, scrupulous type <laughs> loans to people. Although no you know, job, I, no credit, no yeah, problem. <laughs> that was me, but bear in mind, it was legal back then. And then, you know, we were told that that was normal. So, 
you know, fast forward to today, it looks a little different, but that's how I got started. And about two or three years into that, um, I started my own mortgage company and that was about 2005, 2006. And, uh, you know, I was actually sitting in this office right here in March, 2007, when the, uh, financing spigot got shut off. And uh, from there, we ended up going through uh, the Great Recession. But during that time, you know, I was buying and uh, flipping some properties, probably one or two at a time while I owned my mortgage company. I did the, um, you know, what you have now coined, probably one of the most uh, well-known phrases ever is the house hacking, right? So prior to Brandon Turner coining this phrase called house hacking, I lived in a house <laughs> with a bunch of buddies, uh, fixed it up and rented it out. And then uh, I sold that before the bust, uh, made about 200 grand. So that was kind of my my big casino win, we'll call it, you know, um, heading into the downturn, which was good because I was then flush with cash and not with make believe equity. Uh, so when we did hit the skids there and, uh, you know, mid 2007, um, I did have a fair bit of cash on hand, which was great. I actually downsized instead of upsized. So I went from a house to a townhome, which the only reason I really did that, I mean, I can't say that I had, you know, great foresight or anything, but uh, I had a boat. I did buy a boat with some of that money, which was probably not the smartest thing to do. But then I took that boat and I docked it across the street from my house on the Willamette River. And so I thought, well, I'll just live in a town home and I'll have a boat and there's a bar in between. And it sounds like a great way to live your 20s, right? <laughs> so that's what I did. Um, but then back to the real estate side of things, uh, you know, 2007 happened. By the time we got into early 2008, I decided to essentially close up my mortgage shop. Um, I, I was doing a little bit of originating still, but I had a partner who had a Washington license and I kind of handed everything off to him. And then November 2008 is when we opened um, or filed the paperwork for what is now TTM Development Company. And so we basically, um, or I decided at that point, I didn't want to generate really any of my income moving forward from originating loans. I wanted it all to be in the real estate investment space. And so we went from, you know, basically, or I went from in the loan side to full time into the house flipping world. And over that time, I guess I should say I did acquire a number of rentals. So I built out a, a decent re rental portfolio, some of which stuck, some of which didn't, um, you know, depending on when I bought them on the run up some of which I still own today. Um, but from 2008 on, we started uh, basically buying and selling property as kind of our active income. Um, and that's been my main income ever since. And, um, you know, we went up uh, by when you guys had me on the show in 2013, we had kind of, um, you know, ascended from buying, you know, your typical um, three bedroom, one bath, three bedroom, two bath ranch style home, all the way up to um, building a multi-million dollar new construction. So the last time I was on the show, it was right before what we call the Street of Dreams here in Portland, which was our first multi-million dollar new construction, which I'm happy to report. We ended up selling that right after the show um, for just under two million bucks. We did pretty well. And from there, we started doing a lot more new construction. We also did a lot of renovating. Um, but now, here we are, you know, uh, end of April, beginning of May 2020. And, um, you know, things are, are feeling a little bit like 2009, 2010 um, in certain segments of the market. So that's me in a nutshell. That's cool, man. Well, there's there's a couple of things I remember from last time we talked uh, back, you know, what are this, almost seven years ago. Uh, I remember one, you had the postcard. Didn't you have the postcard with your dog on it? I do. Was that, I did. That's what I th yeah. did. Okay. Yeah. I remember that because I remember that stood out to me. It was like, what the dog's name buys houses or whatever it was like. I thought that was super clever. Uh, I'm happy to report George is a Mastiff and he's still alive yep. seven years wow. later. Yeah, he's nine That's and That's good a half. for a Mastiff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that postcard was pretty popular, actually. I do remember a lot of people reached out to me after that show and they're like, hey, I made a postcard with my dog on it. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if it pulled as well for them or not, but people Yeah, I don't like know. It. But I thought that was, I thought that was clever. And then the second thing I remember about the show is how Josh and I just could not get over how much you looked and sounded like Matt Damon. And, uh, I, you know, now you have a little bit of a facial hair. I think you're trying to distance yourself from him, but, uh, do you still get recognized as Matt Damon from time to time? Occasionally the beard kind of throws people off a little bit, but, uh, originally I, yeah. you know, I grew it to look older and now I just, you know, people kind of, you grow accustomed <laughs> to beards, right? As, uh, looking at you, you both do. of you guys. Actually. Well, well, it's actually a state law now in, in the Pacific oh, Northwest. Yeah. You can't live in Portland or Washington, you know, Washington, or Oregon. And that's where you're, you're in, you're in yep. Oregon. And, uh, what, what's your volume look like over the past, like couple of years? Like what, what, what kind of numbers are you doing in your business in terms of like how many flips or how many builds? Uh, we're probably, you know, let's call it, uh, seven or eight new construction and then probably similar to that on flips. So not a, you know, comparatively to the narrative out there of, of huge volume, we're not it, but we're higher profit margin, lower volume. And that's been the business we've been running really since I talked to you in 13. Um, we did more flips, you know, I was just looking through 
those lovely, um, you know, clearance file cabinets that I have back there, along with, you know, you can see my circa 1972 office environment here. I'm a big fan of C-class yeah. office space. But, um, you know, I was pulling <laughs> old files to kind of, you know, really dig into what we were doing in like 2008, 2009, 2010 to kind of reacquaint myself with the transactions we were doing that were successful and unsuccessful. And um, we were doing a lot more volume back then, but then we were also doing lower price point, um, a lot of kind of smaller type remodels. Um, but now, you know, we've moved up price point or we have over the last, you know, seven or eight years um, dramatically. And with that comes a higher, you know, profit margin uh, attached to each deal. We've also raised a lot more capital. We're doing a lot more construction. So we're like, a, you know, not an incredibly high volume operation, but we try and be as highly profitable as possible. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think people focus a lot sometimes on volume. Like David, you make this point all the time, right? Like, oh, I got 12 doors. I, I got 100 doors. Yeah, well, each of your doors make $3 a month. So congratulations. It, that's a lot of work. People say it as a bragging metric and it's actually the opposite. I hear that and I'm like, oh, that sounds horrible, <laughs> right? Like, oh yeah, I have 75 foster cats that I have to take care of all the time. And, <laughs> you know, I, uh, it reminds me of a, a quote I was reading yesterday that Newt Gingrich said, and it had something to do with the fact that a lion can catch field mice all day long, but it will die because the caloric content of a field mice is less than what it takes to go chase it. So instead, lions chase antelopes. And a lot of us in life spend our time chasing field mice because it feels good to say we did something like I caught 75 mice today. But really, you just wasted your entire day and you didn't get anywhere. That one antelope could have fed you for a long time. And that's the same principle I see going on here. I'm curious though, Tucker, because you said you got out of the loan origination business. I just started a, a company to do loans and I'm wondering, did you get out of it because you recognized that the return on your time and the frustration was just more than you could get if you put your, your effort somewhere else? Yeah. You know, to be totally honest with you, I never loved the loan origination business. It was just, it felt like a real grind. Um, and the, the kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, um, it was, you know, 2008, 2009, I actually was being audited a bunch of different ways by the state finance securities division. And so they would audit you and then they would charge you hourly for the auditors. And then when I got the bill, I remember looking at it, they charged me for the drive time for the auditors to drive from Salem to Portland. And I thought, so you're <laughs> charging me for the audit and it was an absurd amount each you know hour, but you're also charging me for the time that it takes them to drive from Salem to Portland before they even start the audit. And I, at that point I was like, you know what, forget this. It's just not fun anymore. And so, you know, it was a tough decision. It wasn't like an easy one because I'd been making a lot of money doing that. And that was my primary source of income up to that point. But I just kind of got burned out on it. And um, I don't think I'd go back maybe in like a, a consulting or like high level way. Maybe I'd be in the mortgage game, but I wouldn't want to be on the front lines originating. That's a very important factor to consider though, for everyone listening when it stops being fun, when you start to hate it, when it's what Brandon and I call it becomes heavy, it's just a heavy thing. It gets to be where you're going to lose money because your subconscious will be working against you. An opportunity will cross your path and instead of pursuing it, you're actually going to like find some way to avoid it or you're not going to want to work that day. You're going to sleep in instead of getting up. And if you think like what I learned with was when I would be really hard on myself when a deal didn't work out like I thought that it should, I would not want to go chase the next deal. And I realized if I do this and I miss three deals a year just because I'm not in a great mood for the next 20, 30 years of my life, that's going to be a massive impact on my overall wealth. And I recognize that, you know, you kind of have to protect your emotional health if you want to be uh, financially wealthy. I agree. I mean, it, you know, if you're in the mortgage game at all, like the challenge was I was in the broker world, right? And so with the broker world, you're, you're dealing with these wholesale lenders and you've got underwriters that are not in the same building as you. And then you've got customers that you're kind of playing the go between with. It's just, a, it's a real tough world. And now with all of the additional, you know, guidelines and overlays and, and things that are required, it's just, it's a tough business again, in my opinion. And, um, you know, people will weather through it in the last, but it just wasn't for me. Hey, I got a question on that, on that. I know I want to get to like the market stuff and the real, like, you know, the relevant timely stuff, but you know, something that it doesn't depend on the market. I mean, it's completely irrelevant of the market. It's something that David brought up about if you're not in it, if you're not feeling it, there's this, like, maybe you shouldn't pursue it. But at the same time, there's like, it's like the question what I'm getting at is when to grit and when to quit. Like, when do you just buckle down and say, you know what? I'm not feeling it today or this week, but I'm going to, but I know that I just need to keep working my process. And when do you say, you know what? I'm just done. I'm tired. Like it just, it's not for me right now. I'm going to move on to something new. Cause a lot of people are thinking that maybe in their, in their job, they just want to, they're not sure if they should stick with it or their side hustle or whatever. So when do you, when do you see that difference? I mean, I love real estate, right? Don't get me wrong. Like the, the whole real estate game, like all facets of it, some I'm focused in, right? That's it, which is challenging because 
we all have this shiny ball syndrome and we're like, ooh, storage units, ooh, multifamily, ooh, new construction, right? Like it all kind of, you know, is interesting to me. But, you know, I just looked at it. Number one, I was, I was burned out. I'd done it for a, a number of years. It wasn't like I gave it a month of trying to do something like, you know, let's say you're, you're trying to learn how to direct a market directly to sellers and you give it one campaign, and you're like, screw it. I'm not going to grind it out. I don't want to do it. I mean, I'd been doing it for years and I just knew deep down that it wasn't fulfilling for me. Um, but I also knew that there was a better way to make money in this business. And so the real estate investing side, I knew that was a better way to make money. I just had to learn that side of the game. And so I just decided to go, you know, dive in, you know, head first and really figure that out. I'd had some success with it, which helped, but I knew that there was just a better way. I mean, being transactional on the loan side, it's like the toughest way to make a living in this business. I mean, realtors, you have predetermined uh, commissions that you're basically paid on the loan side. You're scratching and clawing and you're bid against other people on rate and fees and everything. I mean, it's just a tough way to make a living, um, you know, day in and day out. And I just got burned out on it after years. Yeah. And that's, you're saying, I mean, if, for people listening, if that's what you're feeling, if you relate to that, you're like, yes, that's so frustrating. I, I have what I thought was a good deal. And then the client's beating me up on the price. And when it's all said and done, and then I pay taxes, I'm like, why did I even do that? I would have been better off bartending one night a week or something. Then you've got to look for a way to get out of that position. You're hundred percent right. The way that I bet if you tell us how you feel now, you're excited, you see that deal and it feels like an antelope and you're going to chase it with everything you got and you're going to get the best out of yourself. And that's just, you got to listen to those internal voices that are trying to guide you to the right place for you. That's not to say this is the easy side either, right? I mean, you know, I, as we were talking about before we started recording, I mean, I get people to tell me they want to kill me occasionally with the messages they leave. <laughs> um, you know, we get yeah. a lot of NIMBYs around here that hate redevelopment. And so, you know, I get people cruising by my house at eight o'clock at night yelling obscenities because they know where I live and they don't like the fact we're building new construction in the area. I mean, so, you know, there's definitely challenges on this side as well, but I just, I have much more of um, a fondness for this side of the business. This is where I wanted to be ultimately. And so that's where I am. Well, it's a good thing that your best friend, uh, Ben Affleck is now Batman and you can call <laughs> on him whenever you need. <laughs> that is a good that is true. That is true. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about the real estate market, uh, the, you know, the changes that we're seeing right now. What are you seeing personally right now in your market uh, in the Portland area? And are you only in Portland? Do you do, you do Salem and other areas? And then like, what are you seeing? I'm purely in Portland right now. Um, you know, obviously I talk to a lot of investors on a, you know, fairly high level across the country. So I'm kind of getting a read on other markets as well, but I don't, I don't want to speak yeah. to that today. I'll just talk to, you know, what I'm seeing in Portland and then you can kind of take from there what, what will happen across the sure. country. But you know, we're kind of, um, we're in a unique position right now because our, we're in kind of multiple buckets in terms of price points, types of buyers, product, things like that. And so, you know, kind of the tale of two cities, we'll call it, you know, we had one house that we sold last week that was, you know, slightly under median price point for an area called Lake Oswego. And even in the midst of this whole Corona mess, um, you know, we had multiple offers and it sold over list. Now it was a little bumpy coming into closing with financing and people deciding whether or not they really wanted to pay that number and, you know, just challenges like that, but we got it to closing. And then on the other side, we've got some, you know, million plus dollar new construction that's on the market that's pending right now. And we're taking it in for closing, but you know, that market is very stagnant. There's very few buyers out there. Um, those buyers that are out there are bargain shoppers. And so we're seeing the median price point preserve its value still, but we're seeing the higher end really start to give back and give back quickly. Now, whether or not it's going to be a, a sustained give back or whether or not it's going to be a blip, I don't know. I can't really speak to that for certain, I, but my gut's telling me that it's probably a sustained give back to some extent and certain pockets more than others. Um, but right now the median price point, I mean, you probably see it in your feed too. People are like sold a house in 24 hours with four offers. And you know, so there, there still is a lot of activity out there in that kind of closer to median price point. But once you get into the higher end in whatever market you're in, it's soft. And uh, from what I can tell, probably about a 10% reduction in what buyers are willing to pay versus what stuff's listed for right now. What are you going to do differently? Cause now you said earlier that we're, it, it's looking a lot like maybe 2000, you know, nine, 10, like if that happens, wh how does that change your business? What you're doing? Do you stop developing? Do you focus on the lower end or what, what, where do you see yourself headed? There's a number of things, um, you know, that we'll probably start to do different. I, I will say, regardless of whether or not, you know, we're in the, the more median price point bucket that's selling easier or the higher price point bucket that's taking more work, 
the buyers feel a lot like 2009, 2010, where like this morning I got an email of like, hey, we were over at the house this weekend and there's like 30 things we noticed that we'd like punched out, right? And so I was like, well, that's circa, you know, 2009, 2010, where everybody wants everything just yep. perfect, right? As opposed perfect, to like, yep. I'll take it, you know? Um, so, you know, that's one thing we're preparing for is just to kind of an ongoing that, but more than that too, you know, I don't know if you want me to get into it yet, but we've got, you know, kind of some rules that we're going to kind of operate by. I, you know, I told you, I went and yeah. looked through all of our previous stuff that we'd done just to kind of reacquaint how we navigated it last time and what applies this time. But yeah, we're going to do a, a variety of things. The, the first is going to be, you know, I can get into the nuts and bolts here, but the biggest thing will be, we're going to dial back our high end, um, exposure for sure. And if we do do high end, it's got to be A plus lot, A plus area, nothing that could, you know, be whether internally or externally wrong with um, the property. And we can fix the, the internal stuff a lot of times, but the external we can't, right? So um, we're going to limit our high end exposure for sure until we can kind of find a bottom in it. But I don't know, do you want me to run through some of these things? Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, let's do it. So I would say for everybody listening and just this is essentially what we're doing. And I'm not like a poster child for it because again, we have shiny ball syndrome and we see deals come in and we're like, Ooh, deal, deal, you know, antelope, right. Or whatever David said there. So I have to pull the <laughs> reins in on myself. Like even last week I was like, why am I looking at this deal? Don't buy it. Like, you know, it looks good. It smells good, but it's, it just doesn't quite fit into this box. So it does take some self restraint to do this. So before I go through it, I just want people to know that, but you know, the first thing um, that I'll say is that speed is going to be your best friend on projects, right? So when we do, we're definitely not doing development projects now, because uh, if we do a development project, that means we have to, you know, replat a piece of land to make multiple lots where there's one now. And that's going to be probably a 12 to 15 month process if we don't have delays from, you know, Corona and, you know, people not working and counties being shut down. So, you know, looking forward 12 to 15 months, I don't know what dirt value is going to be. Um, I especially don't know what dirt value is going to be when we're talking a million dollar plus new construction. Um, it's going to be a real challenge to kind of forecast that out. So the speed is our, our best friend here right now, which means we're going to take on, you know, essentially smaller projects, quicker to market type rehabs. Because that's pr our primary function is we're, we're new construction and rehabbers, right? We wholesale third, but primarily we're rehabbers and new construction. So you know, we're going to look for stuff that we can kind of, you know, take down and we can take it back to market as quickly as possible. And that then takes me to kind of the second rule that I'm, I'm trying to abide by. And this is where I almost broke my rule last week, but we're going to try and buy homes that are not as old as we would have previously. So like anything that's like fifties, forties, um, you know, somebody, I, I did a webinar last week. It's, I said, don't buy forties houses because that's what we didn't do back in 2009. They're like, well, now that's the same as 50s houses. So, I mean, I guess they made a point there. But, you know, anything 60s forward, it's usually less of a project. Um, you know, 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s, they're just a pain in the ass. Yeah, can you explain, for those people who are new listening to this, why, like, what, what's the difference between an old house? Like, what kind of challenges do you experience in those 1910, 20? I mean, you got those in Portland just like we did in Washington, the, 19, the 1900 giant house. Like, what's the difference between that and the newer ones? The first problem you're going to run into is foundational issues, right? Because, you know, I call it the old crumbly Portland foundations. Washington has them too, but they just, you, you pick at them and they just fall apart, right? You got funky, you know, crawl space, crawl space height. You've got lath and plaster everywhere. You've got knob and tube wiring. You've got old windows. You've got funky floor plans. Um, you basically have to redo everything, reconfigure everything if you want to get, you know, a hundred percent of what market value is for this property. Right. So you're, you're taking a very old house and trying to make it brand new, which it's just a lot of work. It really is. And so yeah. then that adds into your timeline to get it to the finish line. And then also the amount of money that it's going to take to get there. Cause the older the house is, the more likely your rehab budget is going to get blown up. I mean, you can try and create a budget for an old house, but I don't know one person that's ever actually hit that budget. And we've done a lot of houses and we still can't get it right on these older ones. You just yeah. can't do it. So we're going to resist buying older homes as much as possible. Ideally like sixties, seventies ranches are like the perfect houses. We just, the one we just sold last week, that was actually an eighties ranch. Um, and that was like, I mean, we were in and out and sold that thing as quickly as we could given the situation. But you know, we didn't have to do a whole lot. We were really, you know, the electrical was fine. The plumbing for the most part was fine. We opened up a wall. Roof had been replaced in the last 10 years, so it was okay. Siding was good. Windows were, you know, double pane aluminum, but they could be kept and cleaned up. Um, you know, so just, you know, the HVAC system was still good. Uh, it had been replaced once since it was built. 
Uh, so just a, you know, a better, easier product to kind of take in a, an investment grade form and then take it to retail form uh, on the other end. So speed of project ties into essentially the age of home that you're buying. The older the home you buy, the longer that project's going to be. And ultimately, the more money you're going to spend on that rehab. Yeah, I remember my first few, I mean, most of the first few flips and rentals I bought were all like, you know, pre-1920s. And so, and I did a lot of my own work. And so like, I was just very used to the fact that like, you tear out a bathtub, the new bathtub that you buy at Home Depot isn't probably going to fit. And you know, you open up a wall and you're going to find problems. And I remember just like, then I started doing some newer house, especially now in, in Maui here. I've been doing like condos and like newer stuff. Like I think like 1970s, the one we got right now is like 1999, I think. And I'm like, it's amazing how much easier it is to rehab a 1990s property than a 1920s property. It's like, it's, just, it's, it's absurd how much easier it is. Like you just cut the drywall and the dude drywall fits exactly the same width. Like how amazing is that? Like, I don't know. It's like, yeah, it goes back to like, uh, almost like what you were saying, David, about the, the mice at the same time. It's not just like the size of the deal, but just like the, a 2000 square foot 1920s house. It's not the same as a 2000 square foot 1980s house. Uh, I mean, it might be half as much to rehab the eighties one. And that's what experience will teach you is the experienced person looks at that 1920s deal and they don't get caught up in a metric, like just price per square foot, or look, there's a comp down the street for whatever they are seeing the effort that it will take to get them there. And then you sort of develop a feel for is the juice worth the squeeze. And that's really what Tucker is describing is he's done this enough times that he's recognized the juice is worth the squeeze in these areas. And now that we're going into some changes, this is how I'm going to adapt. And this is really good stuff because this is exactly how people should be thinking. This is why Tucker's not saying I'm freezing all operations. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to freeze in place and wait to see. He's just making tweaks and moving forward. And uh, <clears throat> older homes is something that because the market's been so hot, we haven't really asked the question, how old is the house? It really never comes up. It's just, can I get it? Or how big is it? But as things start to slow down, that should become something you think about. It's a trap. I mean, it really is because I... I don't know many investors that get done with like a 30s or 40s remodel and they're like, that was awesome. You know, they're most of the time they're like, thank God this thing closed, you know, and in a, in a appreciating hotter market, sometimes you carry a higher price and, you know, you get, you make some more money and it kind of balances it out. And you're like, okay, well, you know, it was good. But when you're in a potentially depreciating market, or at least there's some downward pressure on pricing, uh, you know, your budget inflates here, your timeline inflates there and your price you get for it comes down a little bit. You just rarely look at those and go, that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what else you got for us? So the, the next one, and this is, again, it's going to depend on who you are and your skill set and your market. But generally, I don't want to deviate too far from the median price point in any given area. Um, I know that's kind of a blanket statement, but, you know, median price points, they change a lot depending on, you know, even within a certain area, like, Portland itself has like a median price point of, you know, upper fours, Lake Oswego, where we do most of our stuff, it's in the sevens, right? So, you know, we try and stay around median price point wherever we're at as much as possible. And to do that, quite frankly, you can't really do new construction these days. It just doesn't make sense. It costs too much to build. The permit costs are too high here. So you have to renovate existing construction. So we're going to do the best that we can. You know, if we're going to take on a project apples to apples, we will choose a newer built home that's closer to median price point before anything else. So if you're not going to do new construction, you're not alone in those fears. I'm sure there's a lot, or I don't even know if fears are the right word, just in that, in that uh, being careful, right? There's probably a lot of other developers thinking the same thing. So I'm just curious from an economic big picture standpoint from David, from you and from Tucker, but I'll start with you, Tucker. But like, what does that mean three years down the road? If, a, I mean, are a lot of developers going to stop now and three years on the road now, we're going to have a massive housing shortage or does that not really matter? Do you think that not plays into it? Like, what do you see this long-term ramifications of the new build slowdown? Uh, David probably saw it, but the HMI, the housing market index went from 72 to 30 last month, right? Which was the I don't even know it's what that is. What basically is that? builder confidence, right? So they pull a bunch of national builders and that was the largest drop month over month on record. Um, so we'd been hovering between 68 and 72 for, you know, a number of years now and they dropped all the way to 30. So that basically says, I mean, I don't know if I can swear on this, but it means, it sure. means they're scared shitless, right? So, um, you know, that frightens them, um, you know, based on all the, the economic implications of what's going on right now. So to answer your question, yeah, I think there will be um, probably a, a void at some point. I don't know how big that void is going to be. I don't know how much, you know, they're going to stall out on, on building. I know there's two camps of builders right now in our market. One is just kind of 
blind faith still going with it. And other ones are like, we're pumping the brakes and we're going to kind of, you know, try and read the tea leaves a little bit here before we advance forward on the dirt that we own or the projects that, you know, we're in the middle of platting or whatever. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. What do you think, David? Like long term, what does this do to the, to the economy? Well, I think that we've had a housing shortage, at least in the market that I'm at in a lot of other markets. There's been a lot of, of like wind at the back of the economy of America that's made housing much more expensive. And if you're not in the kind of the upper tier in your market for income, it's already been very, very difficult to buy a house. Typically, you had the first time home buyer, the entry level homes, the kind of like the ugly ones that um, are, have decent bones, but nobody really wants them. And that's where you get your first house and you get some equity and you move up. But a lot of people are buying those as rental properties now, especially the, the ugly ones. There's so many investors that really eat up that bottom tier of the market that like, like Tucker, if he does his job well, he gets that property before it ever even gets to the MLS. And there's a lot of other people doing that because of technology increases and so much capital floating around. So that house that used to make it to the MLS that someone's like, wow, look how ugly that thing is. And someone could just kind of take on a do-it-yourself project and get a good price. It doesn't get there anymore. So that's part of why more homes are tougher to get into. And now there's more regulation. It's just harder for builders to build houses. People don't realize that every time you add a, a permit process, a, a regulation, something to make the job harder, you make it more expensive for someone, which forces them to now build a house that's more expensive, which makes it harder to make affordable housing. And then we scream in the country, we want more affordable housing, but you can't have that with extra regulation. And one thing that people have to understand about a builder Let's say that Brandon, you want to fix up your house. And you're like, well, should I spend 20 grand to repaint it or put a new roof on it? I don't know. Our price is going to go up. It's, it's a $20,000 decision you got to make based on the confidence you have about if that investment's worth it in that given moment. But when you're a builder, you don't get to, to build in chunks. You don't get to upgrade a bathroom or a kitchen. You have to spend the entire amount of capital up front to build an entire asset. And if it doesn't sell, you get nothing back or you have to decrease it massively and you lose a ton of money. The stakes are so much higher for a builder. Yeah, you can make more money building a house um, than just rehabbing one, but you also have way more risk. And so builders have to be extra careful. It's kind of like full steam ahead when the economy is amazing, but other than that, they gotta walk with trepidation. It's just by the nature of the game, they're, they're, they can't break their risk into smaller portions like when you buy a house from the 1930s and then you upgrade the electrical and 10 years later you put a new roof on it. And you know you slowly upgrade that house over time putting little bits of money in it as you feel comfortable. So I think this is something that we should get used to seeing when we have a big scare like this, the smart builders, really any builder that's worth their weight in salt or gold or however that saying goes, is gonna say, I gotta wait and make sure there's someone that wants to buy this house. You know, if Tucker puts a house under contract and it doesn't work, well, he could rent it out, fix it up. He could do less rehab and try to get rid of it faster. He could wholesale it to someone else. There's options that that person has. A builder really doesn't have any options. They're borrowing millions of dollars. They're developing land that could be completely useless if that house doesn't actually sell. And then they're dumping tons of money into building this house with one exit strategy. So with more risk is going to come more expense. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's a big, you know, just so people can kind of understand it. Like if we were to build a house, it's a six to eight month commitment to get to the finish line, right? Whereas if we renovate one of these kind of newer built ranches, yeah. we're in and out in six weeks, right? Yep. Like, so, you know, if you're in a market where you're not sure where the footing's going, you know, where's the bottom going to be? What kind of pressure is coming on pricing? which one do you want to do? And I mean, we're kind of a hybrid company. We've always been like we renovated first and then we got into new construction. A lot of builders are not that way. They just went straight into building because their dad did or a family member yep. or they just started to build a house. Then they never go back. I mean, becoming a great, really good at renovating houses, that's an acquired skill set. You can't just be a builder and then back up and just be a great at renovating houses too. It's, it's almost two entirely different businesses. So yeah, they're, they're firmly entrenched in that new construction world and there's a lot more risk to it. I mean, we have one right now that I'm, I'll have plans approved probably next week for a probably 2.8 to $3 million build. And it looks over the lake. Um, it's in an amazing area. But I, you know, two months ago, I would have been like, let's get this thing built and we'll bang it out and we'll make a ton of money and it'll be great. But now I'm like, I don't know. Is it right? Should we be doing this thing? Um, you know, maybe it's an A plus lot in an A plus area, but still, I, you know, I want to see how this shakes out before I hit go on that. Cause yeah, I can't just do a little bit here and a little bit there. I mean, that's going to be a, you know, million, two million, five build out. So, yeah. Yeah. I, the reason I asked that question too, about 
like what does that do to the economy? Is I'm just thinking like there should be, and I'm sure somebody listening to this has this data, but like it feels like it would not be that complicated of an analysis to run to figure out how many new homes are being built in America every year or in a certain state or market, how many new homes are going in, how many homes are going out, like they're demoed. And then how many new people are starting to buy or rent and how many people are stopping buying or renting, meaning they're, you know, like you should be able to like generally that all those four numbers should generally always even out in a market for the most part. Like, and so when one goes down, one goes up and, and obviously there's some changes there where people double up and they live with their parents longer and, and stuff. But anyway, it'd be interesting to see, like run some, uh, kind of predictive spreadsheet work on that. So again, if anybody has that listening to the show has some really fun details on that, feel free to, uh, I don't know, shoot it to us in a message or something on Instagram and, and let us know. Cause yeah, that's a, cause my, my thought is if we see a housing shortage, even more than we already are, like already, like, like David brought that up point up, we are, there's already a housing shortage. If that happens, especially in like the world of rentals, but also like supply and demand says that, that, that will make, if there's less supply, then demand goes up, the price goes up. So we may see rents going up after all this. Uh, we may see property values going up because of all this long term. I don't know. It's one uh, point that I want to make. And I, I, I made this, you know, in the presentation I gave last week to a lot of our followers is that, you know, going into 2009, when we did a lot of these projects, the average, you know, number of months of inventory on a, on a countrywide level, I mean, it varied a little bit, you know, city by city, but it was 12 months, which now if like, if I told you you had 12 months worth of inventory, you'd be like, holy shit, uh, we are in a tough spot. Right. And so, you know, we were selling houses in 09 with 12 months of inventory and it, didn't seem like it was that big. Of, I mean, it was a big deal, but it wasn't like, oh my God, you know, the world's, you know, on its head right now. I mean, our most recent numbers were at under two months for the Portland area. So there is obviously some supply and demand effects going on. The, the challenge is with new construction and, and how this will fit in is that generally new construction is higher price point, right? Unless you're in middle America where they're platting like a hundred lots and they get their dollar cost average way down per lot and they build them out as cheap as they possibly can and they sell them for, you know, two ninety nine dollars to three ninety nine, right? That's really the only place in America you're going to find that cheap housing, you know, that's new. But generally on the, on the coast, you're looking at like 600 plus for new construction, like entry level new construction. And so as you start to get up into those higher price points, you know, jumbo loan financing is a big issue right now. And getting people, you know, for example, the one we're selling right now, that's a you know, million plus, they have to have 20% down and they have to have, be gainfully employed or, you know, for a while, or at least on an underwriting perspective, it's not going to be an at risk type job. And then they have to have 12 months worth of reserves that are not in a retirement account. Right. So that slims down your buyer pool dramatically. So even though you might have a low amount of supply, that bottlenecking in the in the world of finance or those additional, you know, hoops that people have to jump through or criteria they have to meet, it slims down your buyer pool as much as you have low inventory and in products. So even though you just have low inventory, that's not the end all be all that the you know market should have upward pricing. Uh, we gotta find ourselves an economist to come on here, like some like who's like the top guy in the US with that. We got to find that guy and get him on here. I tell people all the time that really buyers drive markets. It, it, buyers determine how many people put their house on the market to sell. Buyers determine how quickly it'll sell. Buyers determine how much they're going to pay for it. It's how much money the buyer makes. It's how confident the buyer feels. It's how many options the buyer has. It, you, can, you can have a market with a ton of houses. If there's no one to buy them, it doesn't matter. And you can have a market with a, only a handful of listings. But if all the buyers are super picky, they're still not going to sell over asking price. It's really the thirst of the buyer that determines what happens in a market. And so if you want to understand markets, understand all the things that affect what makes buyers want to pull the trigger. You know, part of why it's really hard to invest to buy cash flow properties in the Bay Area is that there are so many people here that would pay way more than an investor because they just need somewhere to live and they don't need a great deal. They make plenty of money. They just want to get the house, right? They'll easily spend 30 grand more to know it's locked up and it's mine and I don't have to worry about writing an offers for another three weeks to find something. So you're going to compete with that, you're competing with, you know, you're trying to find an off market deal. Well, everybody knows their house is worth money out here. It's very hard to find someone that doesn't know their house is worth what it's worth because they hear about it all the time. So that has a huge impact on the psychology of the people that shop here and then the price you can get on the house. And that's why I like to go to other markets because not everybody knows in other markets what their property is worth or they know if I spent 50000 I could make it worth $200,000 more. And a lot of those markets don't have as many people that are primary residents, buyers you're competing with. You're competing with other investors who also want a good deal. So it makes it a little bit easier to get what you need. Well, Tucker, what else you got for us? So I got a couple more that I think are important. So I'll, I'll rattle these off for you guys. But number, uh, I guess number four is, because I've given you guys three. Uh, number four is, um, you know, and you know this, Brandon, and, and I'm sure you do too, David, for like the last, let's call it three years, right? There's been this big 
mantra out there that the key to this business is marketing, right? Marketing to get leads in, leads equal deals, right? And so everybody's put their emphasis or their desire to learn about this business on marketing. Like how do I connect with potential sellers of investment grade real estate? And that's great. And, and that's a necessary skill for sure. But another necessary skill is to understand the product itself. And I think a lot of investors, they don't understand the product itself. And what I mean by that is the actual house, right? And so as we head into a slower market, the biggest challenge that we're going to have is, is recognizing, you know, okay, not only do I not want to buy an older home, but am I buying a house that has some sort of weird functional obsolescence, whether it be internal or external, right? Like, can this floor plan be fixed? Does it have a bathroom on the main floor? If it doesn't, a weird house, right? A hotter market carries that and people look past it. Um, you know, does the neighbor next door have blue tarps all over everything? If, if it's in a, a gentrifying, getting better quickly type neighborhood, then people look past it. But when the market slows, that gentrification stops, right? And then people look at it and they go, oh, he's going to be there for a while. I don't know that I want that. So, or is it on a busier road that, you know, uh, in a hotter market, busier road stuff always sells closer to a hundred cents of what any normal house would sell for off mark or off a busy road, right? You get in a, a solar market, it gets punished by like probably 15%, maybe 17%, where in a hot market, maybe it's 3%, right? So there's all these things that a lot of people just haven't acquired those skills to recognize um, over the last few years because you haven't had to. Now you really need to have a keen eye for that. So I would stay away from houses that have, you know, functional obsolescence, whether it be, uh, or functional challenges, whether it be internal or external stuff you can control. It costs more money to control it, right? Uh, you got to fix things. Or if you can't control it, well, you can't control it, right? So you can't fix that. I had a house I bought, I flipped it. Uh, well, sort of flipped it back in, I think it was 2009, it might've been 10. But it shared a driveway. It was like this little tiny neighborhood, like kind of a, a C-class area, little tiny house next door to a bunch of other little tiny houses in this little neighborhood. And the house shared a driveway, the short little driveway. I mean, only like, you know, 50 feet long, but shared it with the neighbor. So it was like a double wide driveway. But the two driveways basically were just one solid slab, right? So my, and then the houses were on the edges. So the driveway was in between the two houses. Anyway, but the neighbor's house was just a disaster. I mean, just like a broken down car or two in the driveway, piled up windows and all this stuff. That house, like, man, that just did not sell. I mean, I, I put on the market, it was on the market for things six months. I actually moved into it for six months while like, cause I didn't know what else to do. Like I was like <laughs> panicking and had to make the payment and yeah, like that was a rough. And uh, we finally ended up selling it for about what we had into it. I think we sold it for 60 grand, but like, yeah, a year ago, if I was selling the house, I'd probably get like 120 yeah. for it. But like, because people would look past that, like, oh, the neighborhood's yep. fine. Uh, you know, like the neighbor, yeah, we'll take care of him. He's not a big deal, but yeah, it's going to matter a lot. Those kind of issues. So I, I love that you brought that point up. I had not it's thought so about good. That we don't talk about this very often. It's one of those things where when the tide is rising, you don't have to pay attention to what obstructions might be under the water because it just keeps going up. I see that in, in the market where I live in a city called Brentwood in Northern California or close to it. And we have these, this area where they'll build all these houses that share one driveway. So they'll have one long driveway that goes all the way back and maybe six different houses that are kind of like three on each side along that driveway and they'll all share the same thing. And when it's a red hot market, the buyers are like, I don't care. I just got to share a driveway. Uh, I really like that granite countertop and I want to go buy that house and I'll try to talk them out of it and they just don't want to hear it. I'm like, no, 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 this house just feels right. But I know when the market shifts and the tide goes down, nobody wants that. Nobody wants a driveway they got to share with five other people that they don't know and, you, and houses stacked up on each other that close. So it is very smart to think about things like that. Just like the 1910 house doesn't matter at all. Like Tucker said in a hot market, it's all the same when it goes down and there's less buyer demand and people have more options. They don't want a house from 1910. The minute they hear the words knob and tube, they're like, see ya. I don't want anything to do with that. Absolutely. I mean, another example would be, you know, master suites are a huge thing, right? Like it, we want to find a house that has more than one bath. Cause if you have a one bath house, a, that's the type of product that gets punished in a solar market too. Or if you have really small closets in the master, that's the type of house that gets punished in a solar market. Um, you know, let's say it's a 70s, 60s house and it still has the original single pane aluminum windows in a hot market. They're like, I'll take it, you know, whatever. In a, in a cool market, they're like, well, we want the windows replaced and then they get some ungodly bid from some, you know, retail GC that they hand you with their repair addendum for like 40 grand to replace windows and they want a price reduction. You know, stuff like that happens a, a lot. So, you know, you just have to be aware of that. And, um, you know, that's a skill set that some people have acquired, but, you know, a lot of people have not as, as mm -hmm. investors over the last few years because they haven't had to. Yep. That's a big one. And then the the last big one here is just kind of like how 
we underwrite stuff in terms of whether or not we're going to do it, right? So let's say it passes the other tests and, you know, it fits within these boxes that we're kind of creating here for ourselves. And that's the pricing strategy. Like, how do you say yes to a project based on pricing? And so, you know, everybody has their own threshold based on capital costs and distance that they've got to drive to get to the project and what they're willing to take on a project for. That, that varies for everybody, but you can kind of apply these three pricing strategies regardless of where you fall on that spectrum. And so we look at it like we have our hopeful pricing, right? Which most of the time in a hot market, you get your hopeful pricing. Sometimes you get more than hopeful, right? Like you're like, oh, I sold it for 20 more than what I thought, right? Yeah. And then you've got likely pricing. So hopeful would be best case, likely would be most likely. And then you've got, oh shit, right? Oh shit pricing is like the sell it in a day, you know, get an offer in a day price. And so if we can do the project and it makes sense with the sell it in an offer in a day price or the oh shit price, then we do it. And that's how we underwrote everything back in eight, nine, 10, 11, all the way up until really probably later in 2012 um, when the market started picking up steam. But that's how we, we said yes to everything and, and it worked out well. And I think we're going to go back to doing that exact thing again. Yeah. So many investors have gotten like, and myself included, I'm sure David, you probably as well. Like I'm not d down, um, you know, talking bad about people, but like I've got these rose, rose colored glasses. Like our glasses are getting more and more rose colored as we got into the good market. And it makes us like, like rather than thinking worst case scenario, like, well, I think this will probably sell for this price. We just all are all super optimistic. Yeah, it'll sell for way more than we think, you know, or at least like above, like you don't even think worst case scenario because it, it's, it's unlikely to ever happen. Uh, and so I think you're, you're right there. Exactly. We need to be realistic in our pricing and assume the worst going in or at least assume a, a pretty bad scenario. Uh, and if it works out better than that, then awesome. And we all win. But yeah, really good point. Yeah. And I love how simple that makes the decision. Does it meet the oh no price? Yep, then let's do it. We only have an upside, right? If it's, we might hit the likely price, we could miss that. We're, we're not gonna very unlikely to hit the I hope so price, then don't do it at all. Cause, cause it just, you gotta learn how to punch through that analysis paralysis where your brain's trying to figure out 7,000 options of what could happen like a computer and you're just not designed to be that way. So if you make it that simple, we can, we can not lose money. We can at least make money or break even. And then we have a high upside, you know, whether you should do the deal or not. Yeah. There's that flip I'm doing right now in Maui that we're almost done working on. We've been talking about on the show for the, uh, for the past couple of months that I was not sure if I was going to do it or not. So I'm doing it. We bought it for 900 or yeah, right about right. Nine, nine, like eight ninety nine. Bought it for like 900. And then the, the best case, like the, the top price, we were like, you know, 1.3. And then I was like, likely 1.2. And then it was like, ah, 1.1, 1.05. 1 if we had to now today, I'm like, yeah, we're, 1.1, 1.05 might be more realistic. And our, our break even is at about, about a million at this point. So if we sell it for a million, because we didn't have to put that much of a rehab into it, we'd be all broke even. And if we go under a million, like the agreement basically is, okay, fine. If we cannot get a million for it and break even, then I'll turn it into a rental. I'll, I'll go refi it for, let's call it, you know, 750,000, rent the thing out for 5,500, $6,000 a month and call it good. Uh, at least break even over the next little while. But yeah, that's not how that, that those three tier prices, like I really wanted the 1.3, but you know what? It, it just might not happen. You know, well, you're thing. smart. Um, oh, go ahead, Tucker. I was going to say a lot of people are kind of midstream on their projects right now too. Like this came on yeah. last time around, like it was, it was a slow burn to get to like problem status, right? Like, yeah. you know, we had yes. the, I got the calls in March, 2007 of the, the wholesale lenders shutting off their pipelines, which then basically, you know, eight months later, the the Dow cratered, right? So it took a while to get to that point where everybody was like, okay, we need to reassess how we're pricing stuff and what's going on with the world of, of real estate. This was like two weeks, like things changed. Yeah, so there's yeah. a lot of people that are mid stride with these projects. And so like anybody that has a project like yours, I mean, I'd be like, take it to the, we'll call it the, o, the, the oh no price, right? So I don't swear constantly on your show, yep. but let's take it to the oh no price and let's just get <laughs> it gone, right? Like move it because if you listed it hopeful or likely, you're probably gonna have to reduce it anyway and then you're gonna get stale inventory and you're gonna be sitting with everything else. So it's just like, sometimes it's best to just get it to where it sells and goes and especially in a market like this. And sometimes yeah, I was gonna add on to that. you make more when you do that. Yeah. It's yeah. so hard to price a house too low. I've learned this as an agent. Yeah you almost can't price it too low if there's any kind of demand because people will come in and you'll get more than one offer and they'll bid it right back up to where it should have been or even more than it should have been because now you have all that emotional fear of, oh, I don't want to lose the deal. Yeah, I was, I was going to make the comment, but like, you know, don't try to chase the market down. It's kind of yeah. what you're, it sounds like you're saying like, I'm not going to start at 1.3 and then wait a month or two and then go to 1.2. I think we're listed at probably 1.05 and 
if we make 50 grand off it, we'll call that good. And if not, you know, like whatever, we'll deal with it. But also this is why, like knowing like the thing that made me want to go into it, one was because we decided we could rent it out and at least break even. But two, like we are speeding through it as fast as humanly possible. We're gonna have the whole rehab done in, you know, two and a half, three weeks and back on the market again. And, you know, we're already kind of like letting agents know it's coming because everyone else is pulling their houses off the market. So we're letting people know it's coming and trying to kind of pre-market the thing a little bit. So yeah, we'll see. Do you know what the uh, median price is for condos around there? Yeah, in that area, it's actually, this was actually a house, but the median price is like 1.2. Okay. So we're below the median price as well. We'll be the cheapest house in the okay. neighborhood uh, for the past year. So I mean, so, your deal fits within um, yeah. really this box for the most part. Yeah, it fits yeah, within the you rules. You just would have bought yeah, it for cheaper five rules. if this had happened, you know, um, later, but yeah. you can't, you can't fix that. Yeah, mid stride. I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever. We'll make it happen. And so there's a lot of people listening right now that, like you said, are in mid, mid, mid stride. So you know, do what you got to do. Um, don't be afraid to take it. an L though. It's so much better to lose a little bit of money and get out yeah. of the deal than to chase the bottom. And that's just that ego metric of, I can't sell it for less than a million because then I'm losing money is stupid because if you have $200,000 of your own capital in that deal and you won't sell it and another deal comes along that you could have made 50 or 75 grand with that money. You didn't, yeah. you didn't lose, you didn't break even on the deal. You lost 75 grand that you could have made on something else. And that's, that's just what point. experienced people understand is if I got to get out of this deal and lose 10, 20, 30 grand, but I have my capital to go do the next deal and I make a hundred grand. Well, who cares? Yeah. And that's what we're doing with one of our high end new construction. I mean, we're, we're clearing the books, right? I mean, we're making, we're making some money, but not nearly as much as I'd hoped. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm at the, uh, you know, Oh no price <laughs> that I'm selling it at, but yeah. we're clearing the books and we've got, you know, almost a million dollars of capital coming back in. So, you know, there's opportunity yeah. cost attached to that if we sit out there and, you know, hopefully we make another 20 or 30 or 40 on that when I'd rather just have it in play. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, what the dollar amount is. It's, it's all relative, but you get that back in and now you can redeploy based on new pricing metrics for this new world that we're in. Yeah, really good. All stuff. right. So we've got right, well, before, five things to rehab. We've got speed is going to be your best friend in a market where prices are dropping or could be dropping. Buy homes that are not as old as you previously would have considered buying. Don't deviate too much from medium house price in an area that's really, really good. Avoid red flag properties like a bad layout, a busy road, small closets in the uh, master bedroom, shared driveways. And then have your three options, the hopeful price, the likely price, and the oh no price. Those are really good. Thank you. Really Thank good. You. All right, T Tucker, though, let's talk real quick because some of the people listening to this right now are wholesalers. So people who out go on out there, they're looking for good deals. And then they're going to like wholesale them or basically sell them quickly without doing any work to a house flipper or whatever. So wholesale is kind of that middleman, right? For those people who are not familiar, what should a wholesaler in this market, like do the same things apply or do you have any advice for those people? Well, I'll tell you this. First off, we're in kind of a, a front end choppy period here where like nobody really knows what the bottom is going to be. And that's a tough time to wholesale because, um, you know, most of the wholesalers I know right now and that are trying to shop stuff, rehabbers are kind of pulling back. They're not, you know, they want a, <laughs> they want a really juicy deal if they're going to do something right now, because we're just, they don't know, they don't know what's coming. And so wholesaling will get progressively easier as we can conclude where the bottom is on pricing. Um, you know, for example, like the stock market right now, some would argue that, you know, there's another leg down to be had, but it's been trading within a very tight range for the last couple of weeks. So a lot of people think that's the bottom, right? If you take that and you apply it to real estate, we're kind of on the front end. We don't know where the bottom is yet, but maybe a couple months from now, once everybody gets back to work, you'll have a better idea of that. So it'll make wholesaling easier because you're selling to people that just have more confidence that, you know, values aren't going to deteriorate or, you know, as quickly as they could. And so as a wholesaler, generally, you know, if you can, if you can wholesale simple 3132 ranches all day long, like that's like the ideal rehabber product, right? So if that's the type of stuff you go after, you'll sell that all day long because rehabbers can quantify the rehab. They can get to the finish line quickly. They can comp it real easy. There's no functional weird stuff going on with the house and ranches always sell well. So like if you're a rehabber that or a, a wholesaler, excuse me, that would be the stuff that I, I target, you know, whatever that bread and butter type housing is, uh, that's not too old. That's the easiest stuff to sell. So, um, you know, on a type of product to target perspective, that's what I would say. That is so good. Yeah, I just, good. people don't understand how like the home buying market works. When I became an agent, I really opened my eyes. A lot of the time we have this understanding that there are a number of homes and there are a number of buyers and they are equally dispersed amongst each other. And that's even how we look at the metrics. You know, what's that? How long is this house sitting on the market? What's it? How long will inventory last? But when it comes down to making a decision to buy a house, you're not looking at every house like it's equal. 
there's a very specific um, classification of home that will always be in more demand than the other ones. And when the market becomes hotter and confidence goes up, people are willing to stretch a little bit further to get there, which ultimately ends up in luxury housing. Like you said, Tucker, that's what you think is most at risk. As the market gets more uncertain, people pull in, they get scared and they want to keep things close to the chest. So they're always going to be going for those bread and butter, like a little bit under median or right at medium price homes. They don't need to be completely gorgeous, but they should be clean in a good neighborhood without weird stuff like a busy street or a shared driveway. Even in a terrible real estate market, those houses will still perform okay or good even. It's everything that isn't the ideal home that will start to suffer. So like you just said, or, or this will work for area as well. If you're, if the market gets bad, San Francisco doesn't really get that bad. People still want to live in San Francisco. It's those cities where you got to drive an hour to get into San Francisco that get crushed because now there's no reason to stretch out that far. So if you just understand that principle, like you said, when, when things are getting worse, you just have to go for the more primo properties that you can't stretch as far as you could get away with when it was a red hot market. Yeah. Very Absolutely. wise advice. That's a good point. Hey, what one just thought that came to mind while we we're talking about the wholesaler thing. For those people who are listening right now that are new wholesalers or new to real estate and you're trying to get into wholesaling, um, one thing that could work pretty well right now is to, rather than normally how people approach wholesaling, I'm gonna go out and market to a bunch of deals. I'm just curious you guys' thoughts on this because I'm making it up as I go here. But rather than going out and marketing for a bunch of properties, seeing what you can get, getting something under contract, and then going out to a bunch of buyers to try to get some, like, get somebody to buy that thing, so you're just like blasting and blasting. It almost seems like it would make more sense at this point because we don't know who's going to be buying your deal and there's very few people buying. Go find the buyer first. Find out exactly what that guy wants. So like, you know, I want a mobile home park with 100 units. Like, that's what I want. David wants something specifically. Tucker, you want something specifically. Those ranch houses, right? Go talk to the, whole, the, the end buyer. Tell me what you want and then go out and find that thing. And wholesaling should be a whole lot I mean, simpler in two regards. One, you don't have to market to a bunch of different people necessarily. Uh, but two, you know, you can really focus your, your marketing on one specific product, get really good at that thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I mean, you know, for a while now, there's been, for lack of a better term, a lot of dumb money chasing deals, right? And so with that yeah. becomes a much bigger buyer pool. And so people are just throwing stuff into the piranha pit, right? And they're like, I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it. But now it's like, just yep. find a, a few good guys that actually are well capitalized and are still buying and they know what they want and just go find that for them. Um, you know, it's, that's it, you know? I mean, you're actually at a pretty good point if you're just getting into wholesaling because we've been in probably the most competitive wholesale type environment that I've ever seen for the last few years. Well, now the tide's going out, right? And, you know, people are not gonna wanna spend as much money on marketing, they're gonna freeze it. Their, their operations are kind of unwinding a little bit. I mean, there's a lot less noise in people's mailboxes. There's a lot less, you know, uh, ringless voicemails going out. There's a lot less cold calling happening. You know, all those things that wholesalers did at, at such a huge volume, you know, previous to this happening, you know, there's just a lot less competition out there. So if I was getting into it now, I mean, it's as good a time as it's been, in my opinion, um, in the last few years. All right, man. Well, let's head over to the next segment of the show and uh, dive a little bit deeper. It's time for the deal. Deep dive. Deep dive deal. Let's do it. All right, let's get to the deal deep dive. Tucker, we want to get into the details on something that you've bought. Uh, do you have something in mind, something that we can talk about? Yeah, there was a, well, let's look at a couple deals um, that uh, I, I actually bought. We'll call it back. I think these were 2009 deals, but they, they apply to oh, cool. exactly what I'm talking about now. Um, and so, you know, this might be a good place to kind of insert, um, you know, not only am I talking it, but this is what we did, right? Start with number one. Well, what we do, because if you got you got a couple of ones in mind, right? We sure. Two. Yeah. All right. So let's just do all of one. We'll ask all eight questions, and then we'll do all eight on the next one. Uh, first one: What kind of property is the first deal? So just to frame it, one will be a. Good, we've made money yeah. on both, but one would be one I do again, and one would be one I wouldn't. Okay. Right. So that people can kind of see okay. the disparity there. Sure. So what kind? What kind of property is it? So the first one we'll stick with the theme here. This was a classic uh, three bedroom, one and a half bath ranch style home. It was about eleven hundred and thirty four square feet, and it was built in nineteen seventy eight. Uh -huh. And we'll call this. Uh, Curtis Avenue, which um, I guess there's a lot of people listening to the show. I won't give you the actual address, but if you look up Curtis Avenue in Portland, Oregon, <laughs> and you look back to 2009, you'll see that uh, TTM sold a whole a couple of homes on that street. <laughs> yeah. All right. How did you find this deal? 
this was back in 2009. So if, for those of you guys that, uh, you know, heard stories about way back then, or you actually were in the business back then, there were these things called REOs that came on the market. And you used to call and romance REO realtors and tell them to uh, call you first if they got any listings that were in absolute terrible shape, or you watched them on market for a while until they hit about 90 days. And then you started blasting lower offers at them. And so this one um, was oh, yeah. actually an REO agent that, uh, you know, we called and romanced a little bit and uh, they gave us first crack at it because they were going to price it aggressively. And so we actually bought it on market. So back then you could do that pretty easily. And I think you will moving forward a little bit more easier than you have in the recent past. But this is when we got off market. It was an REO listing. I remember those days. I was not much at romancing at that point. I was kind of just like, Hey, I got some money. Do you want to give me your house? It was just, I just like shotgunned it, you know, just the total inexperienced. <laughs> just trying to talk to every single person in the room instead of going deep with the right one, but you did it the right way. How much was the property? Back then, believe it or not, you could buy houses for $134,000 in Portland. Um, nowadays, that's a cheap piece of dirt way farther out, but uh, we bought it for $134,000. I pulled the numbers on here. I assume you want me to through them, but we actually renovated the house, believe it or not, for 31 grand, which is virtually impossible to do these days unless you're just painting and carpeting something for the most part. But um, we did a- That's one thing we don't talk a lot about, about how it's amazing how much more expensive rehabs got. Like it, it blows my mind. Cause it's like, do contractors just charge twice as much as materials twice as much? Not even twice. It's like five times more. Sometimes it feels like I don't know how that happened, but it, it did happen. Labor has gone through the roof. I mean, our labor, I was looking at labor line items. I mean, we paid a lot less for labor back then. I think moving forward now, because like, I don't know about you guys, but the subs that we've been using for the last couple of years, like it was us getting on the phone, like, hey, do you got us on the schedule? Do you got us on the schedule? Do you got us on the schedule? And, you know, after the fourth call, yes, we do. Now they're calling us like, do you got any work? Do you got any work? Do you got any work? So what does that tell yeah. me? Well, it tells me they're going to work for a lot less money moving forward here yeah. while we're in this period. So. Yeah, uh, labor prices went through the roof um, over the last few years. But we bought this deal for 134000 We renovated it for about thirty one, And then this was in, um, let's see, we sold it in, on 10-22-2009. So keep in mind, it's worth of inventory at that point in the market, uh, approximately. And uh, we sold it in uh, three days with multiple offers, and we sold it over list price. So we listed at one ninety nine. We sold it at two oh eight. And so we ended up making approximately 35 grand and some change on this, which for about a three month flip, um, this was a great deal back in 2009, um, especially for the amount of capital that was actually deployed mm -hmm. to buy and sell this thing and the amount of rehab that was done. Yeah, that's cool, man. What lessons yeah. did you learn from this deal? So this one was kind of your classic, um, you know, speed uh, was definitely a, a lesson here. So, you know, it was a quicker rehab. We, we were in and out, um, you know, much faster than, uh, you would be with an older home. It was a simple house. It was, you know, a little over a thousand square feet. There were no structural changes that needed to be done. It was basically paint, carpet, surfaces, light fixtures, things like that. Um, it had a standard bed bath count. So, you know, it had, um, it had one and a half baths. So it didn't have a master suite, but we weren't, we were selling it below median price point at the time. Median price point was about 270,000 for Portland. So we could get away with not having a master suite and still having quite a bit of demand for a turnkey product. You know, it was a quick rehab for the profit and the amount spent. So, you know, back then we, we kind of looked at stuff like, okay, if we spend about 30 grand on rehab, we want to make 30 grand on profit. That was kind of our metric that we used. And um, this one fit it. And under the timeline that we did stuff, um, it worked out great. And this, just to kind of like project forward, this is the exact deal that we did um, with different numbers, of course, that sold last week. You know, we bought it for 420 and some change. We put about 65 into it and we sold it for 615. So we made a little more, we spent a little more, but it was basically the same project in a different time period in a slightly different part of Portland, but it was the same house. Uh, last question on that on that deal, the Curtis Avenue. How did you fund that one? I think that's the only thing we didn't cover. How did you? That one, we only paid 134 grand for it, so I paid cash back then um, for it. Was that was that part of how you negotiated it? Yeah, that was part of it. I mean, it was it was really tough. God, I made the rounds back then, going to banks, being like, "Can I get rehab financing? Can I get rehab financing?" And it was like, "No, no, no." So uh, we raised a little bit of money, but I, uh, all the REO stuff we bought back then was mainly with uh, just a, the little bit of cash that I had from that first house that I sold and some other money I'd made. All right. Well, next property. What was the second deal? What kind of property was it? Another house. So the next one is basically one that we wouldn't do now, and this really, you know, it doesn't fit within the box that we kind of went through. But um, this one was on River Road in Milwaukee. And the reason being is because this was a 1947 house. So it, it basically needed everything. It had funky, weird 
places. Uh, you know, the plumbing was bad. The electrical was bad. It had a roof that was kind of sagging. Um, it was bigger square footage wise. Um, so obviously that costs more, but we paid 155 for it. And so at the time, you know, I was like, well, 155 seems cheap, right? For the amount of square footage, but the more square footage you have, the more money you got to spend on rehab. So we spent sizably more on rehab on that one. I think we ended up about 83,000. Um, we had hoped for somewhere in the sixties, we ended up at 83. So that's what happens when you buy an older house, your, your budget balloons. We ended up selling this. Uh, it took a couple of weeks on market, but we only got one offer on this and we ended up taking five grand under list. So it didn't perform that well. We only ended up making about 27 grand and some change on it to do like an $80,000 remodel. So this kind of goes to show like, you think it looks like a great house and a great lot and it is, but it just, at the end of the day, you sell it, you make money, but it just doesn't, it's not one of those you do again. You look at it and go, yeah, we made money. Yeah, we turned it over. It looks great. You know, the lot's awesome, but we just didn't make enough money because you just, it's hard to buy these older houses cheap enough to do everything that needs to be done and still make money, you know, as, as the market's softening. And you got to think, even for yeah. people that hear, 27 is not that bad. I'd do that. You're not thinking about your capital gains taxes that come out of that 27,000. Now it's basically cut that in half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's earned income, right? So yeah. you're basically paying earned income tax. So we sold it for 295. So that was a little above median. Um, but when you spend 83,000 in the middle, that's mm -hmm. what you get. Right. Um, and that's, so I, we wouldn't do a deal like this. And this just to kind of project forward, this is basically the exact deal that I looked at last week that I told you, Brandon, I said, I had to pull the reins in and be like, okay, it was in a good yeah. spot, but it was a, you know, it was a 19, 20 something house. It had a new foundation on it, but God, all the framing was wonky. The floor plan was weird. It was going to need everything. And it just, it still was not going to be like a perfect product once we're done with it, just because we couldn't fix everything about it. And so I kind of pulled from this lesson here and I said, okay, pump the brakes on yourself here, bud, and, and don't go buy this house. So fortunately I didn't. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah. I like the fact that we like, you kind of like wrapped together this show looking at like what, mm -hmm like how these five rules fit and, and with the deal deep dive, they fit and didn't fit. A couple of quick, just follow-up questions on that last, the River Road one. How did you find that property and then any negotiation things that went on in there? Again, this was the 09 era. So we sold it uh, 10, 16, 2009. We bought it in, in June. So it, this was basically all REOs back then. We were buying some courthouse step stuff, um, but this was also an REO that we bought. So it had seasoned on the market. I think this one was on the market for like 120 days. And so we got them to take less, but... I wish they hadn't in hindsight, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, let's do like one, a couple, maybe one final, final question before we head to the uh, famous four. What are you working on now? Like most to improve your business? Like, what are you, what are you working on now? And I want you to relate that to our listeners as well. If you can, like, what should other people be doing right now? Like besides the five rules, just in general, of improving your actual business or so running your business. What are you doing? What should others be focusing on? Just like most people, I've been really auditing a lot of our costs. Um, you know, stupid stuff like, you know, CenturyLink, I've been looking at the phone bill and I'm like, damn, they charge us too much money for the phone lines. And it's amazing. We called them and we're like, hey, we're going to go with Comcast unless you can cut this bill down. And what do you know? They cut it in half and we got the same plan. And then we wow. called Comcast. We told them the same thing about our internet and they cut that in half. So, you know, we've been auditing a lot of our expenses just because it's a good time to do that. Um, you know, but on an actual, the way the business is running front, we're being very aware of the types of leads that we're trying to have come into our world. So we do a lot of marketing to get people to contact us. So we've created a lot of new lists and we do a lot of driving for dollars, by the way, but we're, we've created a lot of new lists in areas that have 80s and 90s construction. And so we're trying to pluck those homes out of those areas that are not retail ready or, you know, slightly off retail um, that we can have conversations with people and hopefully buy those and have a quick buy sell. So we're really ramping up the, the number of lists that have that exact type of product that then we can market to and hopefully we can buy some of those and then take them back to the retail market quickly. So that's, that's probably the biggest change versus before, you know, we were looking for just a lot of really great dirt and we were going to then build out that dirt. So we've kind of pivoted to going back to much more rehabs and, and that's probably the biggest change right now. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well with that, let's head over to the next segment of the show. It's time for our famous four. Our famous four. These are the same four questions we ask every guest every week. I'm guessing yours have changed slightly in the past seven years, but, uh, 
Let's get to it. Number one, current favorite or, you know, high impact real estate investing book that you've read. I don't know. I hear there's this guy named Brandon Turner and he's got some books that are pretty good. So he sucks. yeah. Um, and there's <laughs> okay. also this guy, guy named Jay Scott, who's got some books and there's also this guy named Anson Young. So I, I, you know, any combination yeah, yeah, yeah. of those three, uh, will probably serve you well. All right. Good deal. Sorry, David, you got left out. Oh, of this I, one. I forgot. There's many <laughs> David too, but I just met David. So oh, look at know, that. He's got to come. Back. Yeah. He's that's not a my friend role yet. within we'll bigger pockets. I'm that. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. David's here too. He's he mostly he's just, <laughs> he's just here for security. That's basically all. Make sure that Brandon doesn't get a crazy fan that wants to go hug him or something like that. I'll be I'll be honest. No, I don't read I like a lot hugs. of books. Uh, I listen to a lot of you know podcasts and just kind of take information. Well, and you're also that. making a lot of movies. Like the Bourne series was really right, big. Yeah. I'm sure that that <laughs> takes a lot of time, and you got to practice stuff. your martial yeah. arts. I hear you. This thing called a three year old and a four year old make reading a little tougher. Than, oh uh, man. So. All right, that. Brandon definitely heard you because he was here up all night with little Wilder not sleeping last night. I can see it in his eyes. Okay, so I, I want to ask you about Heather your favorite business book, but if you don't read a lot of books, do you have a favorite business podcast or perhaps a favorite business philosophy you can share with us? Traction was a good book. I did read that one, um, you know, for mm -hmm. sure. There's, um, there's a number of business shows that I kind of listen to, but I, I would say you know, I think I told you this seven years ago, my favorite book just in general, I think you can take a lot of life lessons and kind of transpose them onto business. So like how to win friends and influence people. Mm -hmm. I know it's a classic, yeah. but it's, you know, business is, is just dealing with people a lot of times and you've got some products to sell, but you know, if you can, yeah, there you go. If you can navigate relationships with people, everything else will kind of take care of itself. So I know there's like big overarching business philosophies that you can apply as well, but it really just comes down to how you handle people, whether it be, you know, good situations or bad. And, and that book I think really breaks it down on how, you know, the science to that. I don't know that there's a human being alive that shouldn't read that book. I, it's just that yeah, good. like good for every single person, no matter what you do. That's a very well read book. Okay. What about some of your hobbies? Hobbies. So I'm, I'm definitely not short on those. Um, you know, I, I love playing basketball. It's kind of my outlet to, uh, you know, stress reliever slash I'm just kind of competitive nature. So I actually I built a, uh, an indoor basketball court behind my house. So that's where I've uh, been quarantining, working out. But generally, I play a few times a week at a, a club around here. Um, I love to snowboard. I play a lot of golf. You know, it's just I like doing a lot of different stuff, but those are probably my three biggest. You built an indoor basketball court. What's that like? I mean, what... Well, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing if you want to know, but, uh, <laughs> I do want to know <laughs> it's, uh, so basically we have a detached garage and then off the back of the detached garage, we enclose that. And it's, so it's like a 32 by 32 foot, um, you know, area that, uh, you know, we framed in, it's got vaulted ceilings and then we put up a, you know, a hoop and some heat and, uh, you know, a custom floor. And so it's basically like your own, uh, you know, training facility back there. That's cool. I've been, I've been, the reason I ask is I've been thinking about building up my own private racquetball court uh, here on Maui because I'm like, I want to play racquetball. It's my favorite game and nobody, yeah, nobody plays. Uh, I got a couple buddies that play, but it's like 40 minute drive to the YMCA and I'm like, eh. We'll have to talk about that off uh, offline. I, I will say I was like, oh, do I spend the money and do it? And now here we are a year and a half later. I'm glad I did. So I think you should build your racquetball court. Mm, I'm, I very well might now. Thank you for the encouragement. Last question for the day. What do you think separates successful real estate investors from all those who give up, fail, or never get started? Ooh, that's a big question. I think give up is probably the big takeaway from what you said there. I, I, it, this is not an easy business. I know, David, at the beginning, you know, we were talking about, do you grind it out or do you move on? And, you know, you have to grind it out to a certain extent in this business. You really do. I mean, some days are not easy uh, by any means. I mean, there's always going to be another hill to climb, but I think people are, they're easily persuaded to not climb the next hill or if you know let's say they do a marketing campaign and they get two people that call they're like screw this it doesn't work um or they do one rehab and they pick the wrong house and it ends up being a nightmare and they don't want to do another one you just you have to kind of persevere but that's with everything in life and so i think people just in general need to learn to persevere a little more and kind of grind it out a little more to kind of get to the other side of that proverbial mountain um and once you get there it's great you know because you you know, everything you learn along the way, it's not easy sometimes, but you know, then you can apply all that stuff on the back end and, you know, playing in real estate, it's kind of like a, you know, your own little real estate playground. I mean, I know you guys enjoy it, obviously. And once you kind of know the the rules of the game, it's not to say you still can't make some mistakes, but it's a, it's a fun life to live, you know? Very, very cool, man. 
Well, David, you want to take us out and ask the final question? I would love to. Tucker, where can people find out more about you? Probably the best place for those of you that are in this uh, world of listening to podcasts, you can go on iTunes. Um, the longest running show that I have is called The Real Deals Podcast, and it's Deals with a Z. Um, and then if you're local to the Portland area or the Pacific Northwest, I have a local show. It's called the Portland Real Estate Podcast. And um, I've got a, a co-host on that one. And we talk to basically all the biggest players around here um, that are in the real estate game. So those are probably the two places you can hear me. And then, you know, you can send me a friend request on Facebook, message me there. And of course, you can find me on Bigger Pockets as well. You have a local podcast. I don't know anybody else who has a local podcast. And you've been doing it for a while now. What kind of... Uh benefits have you seen out of that or is it just more of a hobby or do you have actually seen a lot of business uh, success because of it yeah it's it's been great um you know i it was one of those ideas that i had just kind of driving in the car and i was like huh a local show there's an idea um and to be totally honest it took probably a year or two for most realtors to understand that there's this thing called a podcast app on your phone and you can you know listen to podcasts but now here we are 2020 virtually everybody knows how to listen to them and so it's been great um we've connected it's really been great for relationship building with you know agents and other real estate professionals all over town but it's also been great for our lead flow and our deal flow so i insert an ad at the beginning of every show right that's like hey this is tucker with ttm we're looking to buy you know non retail ready product basically. And so, you know, we market all the people that listen to us, both email and audio wise. Um, and so we have a constant stream of leads that come in from free marketing um, because of it. So it's, it's been a great resource for us on that front, but also just kind of, you know, everybody knows who TTM is here locally because of that show as well. Um, and obviously the product that we do, but I would highly encourage anybody that, you know, is willing to stick with it to put together a local show because you most markets have no competition and um, you know they're kind of starved yeah. for something uh, that people can listen to with people that are actually in the real estate biz talking about it locally. I think it's a phenomenal strategy. I should start Maui the Maui Real Estate Podcast. You should, yeah, because like yeah, I mean like you don't need you don't need a quarter million people listening. I mean you get a hundred people listening and those hundred might be super important. Plus like which is one of the benefits of being a podcast guy. I love that we're, I'm going on this tangent now, but like, uh, it's like you get to like connect with people that you wouldn't normally connect with. Like, honestly, I probably wouldn't have ever met you, Tucker, or David Green here, or Hal Elrod, or David Osborne, or any of the guys that we've, you know, Tim Ferriss, Ryan Holiday, like without the podcast. So even in a local sense, you want to get to know that guy that owns a 400 unit apartment complex down there, invite him on a podcast, and there's a much better chance than, hey, can I take you out to coffee and pick your brain? Yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, the last three shows, we've had the biggest agent in Oregon for the last 10 years the second biggest agent in Oregon for the last 10 years and the biggest local home builder in the Portland metro area. So like, Oh, I mean, wow. when am I ever going to get their time on uh, for an hour to, you know, chat, you know, if I didn't have a podcast like that. So good, man. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. David, you want to take us out? All right. Well, thank you, Tucker. I think you shared not only really good information, but very unique and rare information, something that frankly doesn't get talked about. This is a show that you should go back and listen to again and really focus on, you know, as we said, when the tide goes out, you see what was really underneath the water and it matters where you park that ship and you don't want to be in the wrong spot when that happens. So thank you for sharing that stuff. It doesn't get talked about very often. Most people like to just focus on their success, but you really went into some things that can, can get people burned. So I personally appreciate that. I know our guests do too. This is David Green for Brandon, the podcast OG Turner signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.